Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to invite you here um, to talk a little bit about um, some interesting subjects uh, with Professor Pamela Bastanti. Um, she's an associate professor of Hispanic studies in the Department of Modern Languages at the University of Prince Edward Island in Canada. Her areas of research are Ars Moriendi tradition in Spain and New Spain in 18th century convent life in New Spain. She has participated in numerous national, regional and international conferences and has given lectures in Canada, the United States, Mexico, China and Colombia. She has published her research in academic articles, book chapters and in her book entitled Ars Moriendi manuals paintings and funeral rituals in late medieval Europe and 16th century Mexico, New Spain, learning how to live by learning how to die. Dr. Bastanti and her collaborator, Dr. Alma Montero, um, from the Muse Museo Nacional de Virreinato in Mexico, have published a book based on their research on the founding of an 18th century convent in Mexico, La Fundación de un Convento Novo Hispano. El Real Convento de la Purísima Concepción in San Miguel el Grande. Dr. Bastanti is also currently the treasurer of the Canadian Association of Hispanists, Asociación Canadiense de Hispanistas. So, uh, Professor Bastanti, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. It is an honor to, to participate in, in in your project, uh, uh, Dr. Gondim, it's uh, for me. It's 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 uh, an honor to be able to hear to share about uh, this uh, this topic that we we both really find fascinating, and I'm sure that your viewers will also find fascinating, which is um, medieval Spain, uh, 13th century, uh, and uh, one of the most important writers, one of the first poets in Spanish language. So this is, uh, it's uh, wonderful to be able to share this time with you and your viewers. And so uh, before, uh, before we, we have uh, an interview, a talk or an interview, I'm going to share a little bit about the context in which the, uh, the text was written that we are going to be discussing and also a little bit about um, historical background of where this, uh, where this text was written and our poet as well. Um, let me see here. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, we are here in, uh, this is, uh, I was able to go to uh, Spain last year on a, on a family vacation with my parents and my husband and we decided uh, that, well, my, my parents were in the north of Spain and so we decided that we would visit a, a few interesting places uh, that had connections to this uh, text that we were, that we are going to be talking about today, the Milagros and Nuestra Señora. And uh, this particular text is, uh, is a 13th century text. It was uh, 25 miracle stories that were written by uh, the, for one of the first Spanish poets, Gonzalo de Berceo. And, uh, and 
this, this particular text is important also um, to the Camino de Santiago or the Way of St. James. And so we decided that when we, we, were, we were in Northern Spain that we would visit the uh, monastery where Berceo lived and worked. And then also we decided that we would visit Santiago de Compostela uh, just, to, just to, we didn't do the Camino, but we decided that we wanted to go and see it. And so over here we have one of the, uh, one of the first, uh, the carving that they have over the main archway of the main gate uh, as you enter the, 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 um, the cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. As you can see in the center, we have here the Virgin Mary and, um, and then we have, she is surrounded by saints, uh, lots of little angels. And this is, uh, this is also, uh, she is going to be our, uh, one of the main characters that we find in Milagros de Nuestra Señora. Uh, as you can see here in this in this uh, in this map, this is the way of St. James. This is the French trail that we have. The French trail originated in Paris and then had, of course, different start points uh, in France. And they all would walk, uh, the pilgrims would walk from the, now they have the Museum of Cluny, the Terme de Cluny, which is the uh, hot springs there, there, used, there is a monastery, and, uh, or used to be a monastery, now it's the Museum of the Middle Ages. And you can, and the people would leave from that square and walk all the way south through the north of Spain and over to Santiago de Compostela. As you can see here, I have put in this little map in uh, in a blue rectangle, this is the area. This is where Santia, This is where San Miguel de la Cogolla is. This is where Gonzalo de Berceo, our poet, where he um, where he wrote and where he lived. And you can see that it isn't too too far away from the way or from the this path from the French Trail. It is very close, and so it wasn't so difficult for pilgrims on their way to all the way to Santiago to make like a little stop there in San Miguel de la Cogolla so that they could um, they could visit uh, the shrine there because they also have a saint, Saint Emilian, who is buried there or was buried there. And so, of course, it was very appropriate then as they were making their pilgrimage to also stop and visit this, this very holy place and then also perhaps receive some form of indulgence. Uh, they could also spend some time there. And then, of course, uh, they could, in, in, in the way that uh, Berceo's uh, text is written, as we'll see, they, had, uh, they could also hear stories of the Virgin Mary and then also all these, all these uh, people that she had saved in the collection of the book that Merceo wrote. And so, um, it, as you can see, it isn't too far away and so uh, an easy stop on the way from a very, very long way of all these kilometers of walking that they would have to do. Uh, as we go through, this is, of course, one of the famous shells, one of the seashells, the scallop shells, that is a symbol of Santiago, the Apostle uh, St. James, and is also markers. They, the whole way of St. James has these, these signs all over as you walk through the north of Spain uh, in France as well, so that the pilgrims know where to go and that they won't get lost along the way. So this is one of the markers in northern Spain. When I was with my parents, we were in, North, in uh, Asturias, this is the province of Asturias, and this is in the town of Aviles. So they had these, um, these scallop shells markers so that you would know where you, where you were. Finally, after all that walking, the pilgrims would arrive here, and this is where they would receive their, their, uh, their, their, their big uh, indulgence. They would receive a diploma uh, or some form of written proof that they had, they had completed this very, very long and very trying journey because, of course, the, the way of walking, not just the distance and the kilometers, but also they would have not uh, very good terrain. It wasn't, um, it wasn't like highway or anything modern times. It was very difficult walking. And some people would make it and still in, in very um, good and would make it in good health. Some people would not make it. And then, of course, some people would also have to see be admitted to the hospital, which is right beside uh, this building here. It's a hospital that the kings, uh, the king and uh, king and queen built, so that it would receive the pilgrims who were ill, uh, who after after their long journey. So uh, here, uh, one of the details from the main gate there for the for the for for um, the 
Cathedral of Santiago of Compostela. This is, of course, the pilgrim or the, the apostle St. James. You can recognize him because he has a scallop shell on his head up here on his little hat. That's how you know that it's him. Uh, you also, this is, these are just more seen, more pictures of, uh, of the area around the cathedral. This is a big fountain that they have there where the people would probably get some form of water, fill their little canteens as they were walking or gourds because that's where they would have a hollowed out gourd and then they would fill it with water as they would continue walking. Um, just more and more, these are just some more uh, carvings of St. James uh, throughout uh, the, the square there. And of course the relics of St. James. And so this is uh, what every, uh, what all the pilgrims since the ninth century uh, would be walking toward from whatever part of, uh, of, uh, of Europe they were walking, they would walk all the way to to see the relics of St. James. And so uh, this was like the end prize, if you will, from, from this, uh, this, this journey. To this day, as you probably already know, so many people still continue to make the walk to, of St. James. It is not always for religious purposes anymore as it was in the Middle Ages. Now people do it for many things, uh, many reasons. Sometimes to because someone in their family needs uh, or wanted to do it and they couldn't do it some people do it because it's a it's a personal goal to walk all these kilometers and everything but it's a it's a some people still continue to to do this for 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 religious reasons and that's uh and that's its original intent. There are some uh, movies, modern movies that they that they have made uh, recently about the Camino. There's one that's called, I think it's called The Way of St. James and it's with uh, Emilio Estevez and his father, um, Martin Sheen. And that's actually an interesting movie if people are interested, if you're interested in watching this, it's, um, it's, it shows uh, the, the walk and, and also part of the, the, um, the different towns and medieval towns that the people would visit through and sleeping in all these um, these uh, these um, places that uh, where where the pilgrims would sleep and how they would eat and everything it's it's a modern day movie but it gives an idea of what the terrain was like and what the distance was and the struggles of people making this journey so I think that's modern a modern take on this Again, the way of St. James, as you can see, the, the big distance. And we arrive here. This is the monastery. This is the San Miguel de la Cogolla Suso, because there are two. There are two monasteries. There is San Miguel de la Cogolla Suso, which is the old medieval monastery. Uh, it's, it was founded in the St. Sixth century by St. Emilian. However, um, this particular building, as you can see, is probably more in keeping with 10th to 12th century. Uh, this is the Romantic style of buildings, so there's a lot of sort of archways that show uh, Mozarabic influence in the architecture. It is. Uh, it was founded in the sixth sixth century, but it was probably much smaller than this one. It was more like uh, Saint Emilian was a hermit, and so he had a, a group, a small group of people who joined him, and uh, so that's probably uh, this one here was built much later after after him, and is probably around the contemporary to Berceo who wrote at this time. Inside, this is Saint Emilian here who lived in the fifth century, so uh, fifth and sixth century, uh, just an image of him here. So you can see he was a hermit and also a shepherd, so that's why he has a shepherd staff here. And he has also a sword in one hand, and this is because he also fought, uh, he also, uh, he also um, exercised demons from people, and so that's why uh, he has the sword there, the power to, to do that. Um, this is part of the monastery itself. Once you enter the main uh, gateway of the, the, the church chapel there, you find this, uh, this little sort of gallery and you can see that there are some sarcophagi there, almost like tombs of, 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 that were there dug up. Um, and also some uh, rounded sort of archways there that lead into the main church. This, uh, this architecture, as you can see, is very uh, Arabic looking and it's because it was built during the most Arabic time of, uh, of, um, of this architecture in this in this time so around um, 
10th, 11th century, sometime around then. More archways that are inside. This is the church within uh, in, in the old part of the Suso Monastery. And uh, I'm including some, some website here information because uh, uh, you can visit these, uh, hear some information about, see, read more about the monastery itself uh, there on the, on the little links. This is uh, an old picture from 1916. This is where St. Emilian was buried. And so this is his tomb, his sarcophagus. It is now, um, it is now in, uh, it, is, it is not at San Millan now. It is somewhere else. Uh, but, uh, but San Millan it was found there and this is his sarcophagus. And so, um, this uh, to show also that this is one of the main reasons, perhaps also why the pilgrims who would go through the north of Spain on their way to Santiago, they would stop in at at, at this little at this little uh, this little monastery to spend some time, perhaps visiting the tomb of this saint. This is now the uh, new monastery that was built in the 16th century. This is the San Millán de la Cogolla Yuso. The of Yuso uh, and Yuso and Suso have both been declared World Heritage Sites by the UNESCO in 1997. And so they do have this designation that because of their significance to um, in the in the way of St. James, but also because of these two historical individuals who who played a huge part in, in the fame of this monastery. The first one, as we know, is St. Emilian because of his, because uh, he founded this monastery, because he, um, because he was very famous in this area. But then, of course, we have Berceo, who was a, a, a Benedict, a secular um, cleric, who joined the monastery, this, uh, ben the ben Benedictine monastery, and he was um, a, 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 he was a writer, and he was also a notary. And while he was in San Millán, he wrote quite a bit. He has quite a bit of a of a of a, of a, um, a writing record. He would he wrote the lives of saints, three different saints: there's Saint Dominic, Saint Aurea, and also Saint Emilian, the founder of his of his uh, monastery. He also wrote two works that were dedicated to the Virgin Mary. We have Milagros de Nuestra Señora, and then we also have the Loores de la, de la Virgen, which are the, uh, sorry, the Duelo de la Virgen, which are the, is the mourning of the Virgin Mary. And then there are two theological texts that one is El Sacrificio de la Misa, so the sacrifice of mass, and the last text that, uh, the, the second text in the theological ones are the signs of the last judgment or the signos del juicio final. And so he wrote quite a bit at this monastery. And because of all of this, then this is what has given the, this, these two particular monasteries such fame and, of course, the World Heritage Site designation from the UNESCO. We have here also another reason why San Millán is very famous. And San Millán is famous because it was the supposed birthplace of the Spanish language. It is the first place where we have uh, the, the very, the early, early Castilian language. And because uh, we have this uh, text, it was a, a collection of, of, of religious uh, writings here in Latin, but also some little notes that are written on the sides. And if you can see on these particular maps, I don't know if you can see my little, my little um, arrow here, you can see there are some writing here, a little bit of writing in between the, the, the main text there. And on the bottom right hand side, there is a commentary. And these commentaries that were written by the scribe are the one on the bottom right hand side is a very rustic Spanish. The rustic Spanish will read this way. Cono ayutorio de nuestro dueño, dueño Cristo, dueño Salvatore, cual dueño que, e, que get en ena honore, cual dueño tiene en la mandatione, cono patre, cono Espíritu Santo, en los siglos de los siglos. So you can probably understand a little bit, perhaps, if you read it out loud, some of this is starting to sound a little bit more like Spanish. And, it's be, and this is why 
San Millán de la Cogolla is also so important because it has these glosas, these little commentaries in these te the, this text specifically, where uh, it's the proof of the early, early Spanish. And here we have finally um, Gonzalo de Berceo, our poet, also uh, one of the main attractions or reasons for why San Millán de la Cogolla has, um, the monasteries have the designation from the UNESCO as a World Heritage Site because of the importance of this poet who was born in the 12th century and worked until almost mid 13th century. He was the first poet uh, in the, the Spanish language. And so one of the first, because there, there might have been other contemporaries, but for him, he is one of the most recognized. And definitely, if you are going to be studying anything in Spanish literature, Gonzalo de Berceo is going to be one of the, uh, one of the author, or one of the writers that you will, you will definitely have to study because of his importance to the language and um, almost, well, the pioneer. <laughs> so, uh, so that is uh, that is just a short introdu uh, an introduction of of what we are going to be talking about today. One of his texts, and one of the most famous ones, is the Milagros de Nuestra Señora. These twenty five miracle stories that um, we have been researching uh, for for this collaborative research project that um, that uh, we are talking about today. Great, oh. Professor Pamela. Um, Thank you. So just to, um, so the viewers can understand a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. like your journey reminded me uh, a little bit about um, the new show part of this project. Uh, when I received a grant from the Banco Santander, it's a, yeah. a bank from Spain and, and yeah. that is also has branches in Brazil, mm -hmm. offered scholars a uh, scholarship to spend uh, a couple of months in Spain conducting research yes. and received a small grant to spend some months in, in Madrid in the St. Louis mm -hmm. University campus and yes. throughout uh, Spain mm -hmm. and to study the Cantigas de Santa Maria. So yes. uh, the idea was that um, because at that time the society was so uh, focused on religious activity mm -hmm. was that um, the, the medical aspects in miracle descriptions could be interesting for understanding the disease. And mm -hmm. this is why we started uh, studying the Cantigas de, de Santa Maria and then uh, proceed with the comparison with uh, Milagros de Nuestra Senhora. Mm -hmm. okay, so people can understand a little bit uh, what we are talking about. And, yes. and I guess it's important because we are uh, uniting different branches of uh, science and then as, as the viewers are gonna see, I think it was a, a nice uh, collaboration that ended up in a publication um, in Neurological Sciences in 2018, 39 mm -hmm. pages 565 five to nine. Mm -hmm. uh, the paper is called Medical and Neuropsychiatric Phenomena Depict in Two Spanish Medieval Texts of Marian Miracles. So if the people are interested, they can um, also pick up in the, in the um, Google search or other uh, ways. Okay, so now uh, we are going to uh, uh, interview a little bit uh, Professor Pamela Bastanti. Uh, mm -hmm. I have some questions for her. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, Professor Pamela, um, tell us ab about the importance of the book Milagros de Nuestra Senora, written by Gonzalo de Berceo. Oh, as 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 I was explaining in in the in the uh, in my uh, presentation earlier. The Milagros de Nuestra Señora is a very important text uh, in, in Spanish literature specifically because it's one of the earliest in Spanish. It is also one, um, a text that is special because it's 25 miracle stories that um, Gonzalo de Berceo gathered and that he then translated, well, he translated, he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't write them, invent them. He used patterns from other texts written in Latin, and then he translated them into this 
vernacular or early Spanish uh, and then set them into a poetic style. And that's what makes them so incredibly special because it has the early Spanish language, but also it was put into this verse that was very easy to remember and even though it was the content itself was religious, it was also uh, it was also uh, an opportunity to be able. He had turned it in almost into something that could then be recited, not just for the exclusive reading for priests and people who had been trained in Latin to read uh, to read Latin. It was something that then could be shared because of the or with the oral character characteristics of this particular text. And so Milagros is Nuestra Señora was very, very good, very important for that because of the rhythms, the, the language, there was a bit of sense of humor in it as well. And so even though it talks about uh, some, some, uh, some people who were having uh, scary encounters with demons and or in had a terrible disease because of some kind of uh, sin that they had committed or something like that. There was always, it was it's very serious, but there was also some humor. And the humor is also through, can be seen through sometimes the words of the Virgin Mary, where she would express something in a way that was that contained a little bit of sense of humor, or sense of humor also in the way that the demons would speak, or something like that. And so then it made the story a little bit light as well. And so uh, it, uh, and then it also something very memorable for the people who would then hear it. So that part is, uh, that's one of the reasons also why Milagros was so important. Uh, one of the other aspects why Milagros was so important as well is because, of course, uh, it is one of, um, one of the main, uh, it's one of, um, so it has some characters in it that are that reflect the reality of what medieval Spain was like at this time, especially in this particular regions, in the way of uh, talking about uh, relationships between the people and perhaps some characters. We have some Jewish characters in the in the Milagros de Nuestra Señora, which also reflect uh, a, a sociological reality that existed in Spain. Uh, some some we see some humor in some of the uh, religious characters that are there, like priests, uh, and also uh, we see the importance importance of the Virgin Mary in these texts because the Virgin Mary at this time was uh, was um, there was uh, the church was uh, was impressing the importance of the Virgin Mary in the salvation of the soul and so the Virgin Mary played a very huge part as well as the saints and so it was also like a, a way to promote uh, these particular um, these particular people, or, char or not char characters in the in the text, but but saints and the Virgin Mary, so that they could um, help people as they were struggling with illness or struggling at the end of their lives. It was someone that they could rely on for their salvation. Interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us about your MA experience with the book Milagros and Nuestra Señora. <laughs> uh, that was it's interesting as well it's uh, it was uh, a very positive experience for me because I had initially started working on Milagros in my undergraduate degree um, but I was able to in, in this in my master's degree to um, to of course uh, dig a little bit deeper and go into studying the Milagros. I established a, a comparison between the Milagros and uh, the Lay of Marie de France, who was, uh, she was a writer, Marie de France uh, from, uh, from Brittany, Northern, uh, Northern France. And so uh, my, my interest was to study um, exchanges that might've been made uh, through uh, along the way of St. James. So French, uh, French influences that would then arrive into Spain, into North, into Spain and possible Spanish influence that maybe went into, um, into France. Uh, but what I really uh, enjoyed discovering in these texts was the, 
the oral aspect, the importance of the oral aspect in the writing of both of these care of these authors. We have Berceo who includes humor and rhyme and all these beautiful uh, sonority uh, elements in his writing and Marie de France did the same. They were worth both working with very different subjects because Marie de France was talking about legends and heroes and from from uh, medieval um, yeah, medieval legends, uh, whereas Verseo was talking about religious miracles, these stories, and um, but at the same time, they both managed to communicate this both of their their uh, their stories in a way that was very very easy on the ears for the people who were who were listening to them, and through very very clever um, transmission techniques with all these son sonority and rhyme and everything. So that was one of um, that was one of for me one of the best experiences working from on my master's thesis was discovering all of this, because um, and finding the elements and and comparing them and and real and trying to figure out well why does this work and why doesn't this or why is the, why did it happen this way and so uh, that was for me one of the reasons why the the master of arts was uh, was uh, such a positive experience uh, you took part in a, a scientific effort to study the medical as aspect of the book Milagros de Nuestra Senora mm -hmm. together with the scholars from Brazil and USA as we uh, mentioned. What yeah. do you consider as the main important findings observed during the investigation and how would you rate this experience? Well, my exp I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of collaborating with, uh, with, with uh, medical uh, professionals in this and researchers because for me it was uh, I had always focused my my work has always been focused on the literature itself and so it was it was a, for me a, a super learning experience because of course I was not familiar with these interpretations at all and so uh, interpretations of perhaps why why some of the characters in the in these in Berseo's texts why they might have been acting strangely perhaps when you know like uh if uh, they had fallen ill or something like that and perhaps the side effects that were the um what are they called uh like the um not side effects but uh i'm trying to think of the word the um oh goodness uh like the the illnesses and then also um just that they that they had been caused perhaps because of spiritual like when you read these texts you say okay well they were they were caused perhaps because they had spiritual illness or they were not perhaps right with with god and so of course they have all these illnesses but by having medical experts look at this and say okay well perhaps they they had um they had perhaps a problem with uh a psychological problem or perhaps they had some vision problems or they had something else and that's that bring that ties in what in that time period perhaps might not have been able to be diagnosed because in that time period they would say okay well it was obviously something that happened because perhaps God wanted this to happen uh, but now with with medical science you're able to look back at this and say okay well perhaps these were some of the the reasons why and it's uh and it's not and so it's just it i find i found that to be interesting for me because it was not something that i had ever thought of as a possible interpretation for uh for a medieval text because when you're studying when you're working in medieval um in medieval times or in in any kind of historical time period generally what you're doing is you're working within the parameters of that time period you're not uh, opening up to other possible interpretations from the 20th 20th century or 21st century or something like that you're always looking for proof from that time period to sort of explain the the reasons why things were were written in a certain way or explained in a certain way from that time period but it was for me very unique because uh, I got to learn so much from all of you <laughs> on this particular aspect and and open open possibilities of other ways or other other readings into into Berseo's work that I had never considered before so I thought that was extremely positive <laughs>
and working and the writing process and everything was also very amazing because we all live in different parts of the world and we were able to collaborate on on this project together which i thought was phenomenal mm -hmm. and you have uh, uh, extensive ex expertise on subjects about rituals and religious practice from colonial mexico Mm -hmm. What were the main difference between the ideas about the physical illness in vice regal Spanish America and medieval Europe? Mm. In your view. Well, let's see. It's um, in a, in in as I was briefly commenting a little bit earlier. In medieval times, and many times when someone would become very ill, they always uh, they would summon. Uh, a doctor from the time and they would say okay well what what is wrong with this person uh, and they would say well there is possibility of perhaps some kind of spiritual illness in these uh, in these individuals and so it was uh, these uh, that was likely then that there was some kind of phys that the physical illness could be explained because perhaps there was a spiritual illness and this is also something true in uh, in colonial Mexico it's uh, you will see in many cases because I study uh, I study the Ars Moriendi, which is uh, the preparation of, uh, of of how how to prepare for for death, and so the manuals that I was reading many times would say summon the doctor so that the doctor can come and diagnose the person, and uh, and they can fix the spiritual illness first so that if then God wants to heal them, they can be healed at the, at the hospital. So it was always the first step was always to have uh, religious intervention in some way, and then go to the hospital. So it hadn't really changed a whole lot in that, in that mentality, in that, in that sense, because, uh, because there, was, uh, there was always a, a possibility that the physical illness was, um, was the product of a spiritual illness. And so if the spiritual illness could be resolved, then perhaps then the person could be healed physically. And so that was one of the one of the possibilities. They also in 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 the in both cases they also had the uh, the theory of the four humors as well, and the four humors uh, were basically uh, just different liquids or fluids in the body, uh, blood and bile and yellow bile and black bile and and. Um, can't remember the fourth one, but I'll mention it in a second. But uh, those, those, these, these fluids that were supposed to be in harmony, and if one was too much or too little, then of course, then the body would, would suffer. And so, in in that case, what the, the ideal was also to have well everything balanced. And so, to do that, then of course we have we have now we can we can we can link that to to bloodletting. You no, know, with people if they were they had too much too much blood in their body, then of course they would cut and try to bring the body into some form of balance, and so that the four humors could then be balanced. And so that also had to do also with explanations on personalities because they had too much bile or they had too much blood or they had too much of something. And so in that case, that explained a lot of these personalities. And so that's some. Something that we see in the Middle Ages a little bit, and also something that carries on into, into, um, into the medical uh, considerations also in in the colonial times in 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 Mexico, with the with the indigenous people uh, with the pre pre Hispanic contact. Uh, these uh, the traditions there were of course uh, quite different. Um, they were um, they had I, I, my my experience is mostly in uh, in preparing for death, and so in this case I can I can perhaps comment on that. Not so much on what happened with illnesses and everything with them, but they were they had two different kinds of death. They had the death that was um, that was almost like uh, like the the one that everybody hoped for, which was going to be at least for the Aztecs, it was going to be through war or through some form of human sacrifice. These were like the optimal forms of death. And uh, to be ill and die in bed or to be old and die in bed was not necessarily considered to be 
uh, a very victorious death. It was something that then would lead the soul to um, the underworld that was called the Miklan. And then the uh, individual would have to journey through the Miklan through all the different obstacles because there were different lands or terrains that they would have to um, journey through for four years before they would finally be at peace. And in between, and every year on the anniversary of their death, they would be allowed to return to the living world where they could then go and collect certain things to help them on their journey. So that could be food, it could be rope, it could be whatever it was that they might need to, to carry on on their journey. And that sort of ties in a little bit with Day of the Dead today, the celebrations in Mexico where they set up these big altars and they put out bread and food and everything. And they expect that, the, um, that the, uh, the, their ancestors will come and visit. And it's for this reason that there's, there's a strong connection still with the pre-Hispanic cultures then in that way that they are still, that that is one of the strongest connections to this pre-Hispanic cultures uh, because they are still feeding the soul. And, and it was similar then during the times also but in pre-Hispanic times. So it was, yeah, so that's, 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 that's the closest thing I can contact or co comment on the, on the Aztec form, but uh, interesting also as well yes very, very interesting mm -hmm. um and to you what's the importance of the study of miracles for literature and for medicine uh, let's see for for literature uh i think it's uh it's i think it's going to it's important because of um it was a text these texts were um commented on the importance of, uh, of certain things. The, the, the miracle texts comment, they're short, first of all, so they're easy to read if you're reading them. They are also easy to listen to if you're, if you're hearing them because you're not going to have to spend a lot of uh, hours and hours and hours. It's very short little stories. They all have, um, an example that they are giving so they're saying okay this is a, this there's some kind of trouble there's the character that they introduce and they say there's some kind of trouble and then uh, it, it trouble because they were either being stubborn or they were they decided to sin or something like that and then and then the Virgin Mary intervenes when they are at their lowest point and then she saves them and then there's like a little moral of the story at the end that sums up everything and says, okay, well, if you believe in the Virgin Mary, then she will save you. And this to, especially in this time period, fits in very, very well with all these pilgrims who are traveling through the north of Spain and, and they're all heading toward uh, Compostela with this goal of completing this pilgrimage that has taken months to complete. And uh, it, fit, it shows the devotion of the people uh, during this time. It also shows that the church at this time was, was very, um, very much into um, communic uh, share, wanting to share the importance of the Virgin Mary and the salvation process of the soul. The same with the saints. And so I think that uh, for, for the... Um, for for the for the milagros it if you're studying them i think it's it reveals a lot about the society in that particular time at the end also the religious culture at the time uh the importance of the virgin mary because it wasn't just one text that was written about her there were several texts that were written about her in the same time period and so it shows the 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 significance that she had in society at that time even to this day if you go to uh if you you go to Spain, you go to uh, southern uh, France, it, Italy, you notice that there is still a, a very strong tie with the Virgin Mary in many of these in many of these regions. And of course, this was uh, established in the 12th century, 12th and 13th century, when uh, when at Berceo at his time was was writing. And so it shows the strong impact that the, that the Milagros had. It's also important for medicine because I think that it shows that uh, perhaps there were other interpretations or, or 
modern day interpretations now to some of these uh, these ailments that happened to to the characters. Now you see you read about some of the characters and they say, oh well, he was crazy or he was he was very he was crazy, but they didn't perhaps know how to diagnose it. They didn't know how to perhaps uh, talking about oh well, he had these visions. Well why why did he have these visions and so by looking giving perhaps a medical interpretation of uh, analysis just uh, dissecting you know taking all these pieces out of the texts and then bringing them together uh, a modern day uh, diagnosis perhaps a tentative diagnosis can be made of, of these uh, conditions that are show, uh, expressed in these texts we will never really know for sure what it was that was uh, the cause or or what 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 these characters had, but it's an interesting, an interesting uh, possibility to 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 be able to see that there are possible, well, possible interpretations of in through medicine of what these uh, what these uh, afflictions were to these characters. And um, in your view, what were the similarities and differences in the way people dealt with the death in these cultures? Uh, in in medieval and um, and the Aztec cultures, no. Uh -huh. Yes, and okay. Uh, the same the same talk and the the main similarities and difference uh, during your studies, uh, the way common people and authorities dealt with these health issues and that in medieval Spain and compared to Aztecs and vice regal Mexico cultures. Okay. Okay. Um, in in um, in colonial in colonial Spain or colonial Mexico, um, the a lot of the the way that people prepared for for death and dying, um, it, it came from from traditions that were brought over in the 16th century with the um, priests that came from Spain. And and it was um, it was a mixture a mixing really that took place in in colonial Mexico in the 16th century between the um, between the Spanish uh, be, between the Catholic uh, and then also with the pre-Hispanic faiths. As I was explaining earlier, we we have uh, we had some um, some mixing here or or uh, between Day of the Dead, for example. It is one of the the most famous uh, celebrations that Mexico has. It's, you see it in movies, you see it in now Coco, the, the animated film by Pixar, you see it in so many different ways. And so you see the colors and everything. And we see here that, uh, that to, even to this day, there, there are uh, celebra that it's celebrated uh, this hybrid form of, 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 uh, of preparing and, and getting, and for preparing for death, the um, the the uh, the the Spaniards when they brought the, uh, the they brought books with them on how to prepare their the Spaniards for death, and then these these books were then translated into indigenous languages, and these were then shared with the indigenous people on how to prepare for death. And these books had the Ars Moriendi tradition, which is what I, I also work on. The Ars Moriendi tradition um, had, in many cases, almost like a blueprint so that the, the people who, who would read them would know exactly what they needed to complete in their lifetime so that they would be ready for death. So it wasn't just a last minute thing. It wasn't like, okay, on my deathbed, I am ready and I will, complete all of this and, and then I die and I'm okay. It was in the 16th century, it was a lifelong process. So they had to, uh, they had to uh, do uh, works, they had to do faith, uh, be, uh, have faith, but they had to do works as well. And many of the works also included being members in confraternities, it included, um, it included uh, giving alms to the poor. It included um, it included uh, 
giving, uh, doing projects for the church. In many cases, there were very wealthy individuals who would give money to the church so that they could, uh, they could build uh, monasteries or, or chapels or things like this. And so all these alms and everything would then give them uh, something that would then help them as, as, as when they went to die, they would have all these good deeds that they had accumulated in their lifetime that would then help them. And so that is, is one of the, uh, I would say it was something that contemporary Spain would also have. So during the colonial time of, of Mexico, Spain also had at that point very similar uh, practices in their preparation for death. In the medieval times, especially in the late medieval times, it was very different uh, because um, with the Ars Moriendi, we had also the Black Death that had happened maybe like 80 years before it was it was um it was it was uh, the original works were written and so people had death very very close to them and so they didn't have a whole lifetime to necessarily prepare for it they wanted to have something that would help them in case it ha a death happened suddenly and so in that case the ars moriendi manuals from the middle ages were very very brief they were short they had even some of them had pictures in them so that it would help guide the person who was dying in that moment so that they could look at the pictures and say okay well in this in this situation what would you answer if i ask you these questions and so in that case they would prepare for death that way so in in the late middle ages it was very very uh it was almost like a formula that they would practice before they but uh, it wasn't a lifelong journey. It was, but they could confess everything at the very end and they would be okay. Whereas in the uh, colonial times, it was more of a lifelong journey and lifelong process. In Berseo's times, uh, as we can see with some of his short, uh, what, uh, some of his miracle stories, there's also a strong emphasis on, on getting uh, or, or find, re getting redeemed before they die. And so a lot, if there were some who had strayed very, very far away, they at least had, they had always been faithful to the Virgin Mary or to the saints. And by being faithful to the Virgin Mary and the saints, then they already had um, someone in their corner who would advocate for them. And so um, in many cases, when they do die at the end, they, they, some of them have the Virgin Mary who is arguing on their behalf so that they will be able to then be saved. And even if they had committed horrible, horrible sins, they, the Virgin Mary or the saints would be sharing this with, with the Mary, with, if the saints had shared with Mary, Mary would then share with Christ. And Mary would, if she, if the, if the, um, faithful person had then share, um, had, uh, been just faithful, had been faithful to the Virgin Mary, then Mary would intercede for the soul directly with Christ. And so in the end, the soul would get saved. But uh, we have here um, more of a focus on, on the mediation process of the Virgin Mary in the Milagros of Nuestra Señora. Okay, good. And, and what's your take of the role of divine punishment, curses, magic thinking, or anathema practice from these societies? Um, there, there was, uh, <laughs> there is some, some, um, I would say in some of these texts, it's almost like there is a little bit of, um, there is some, uh, there is a, a little bit of a role in, in the idea of divine punishment because, uh, in the, in the way of, of, uh, the illness, why did it be, why did it, uh, affect somebody and the illness itself was, uh, was, as they said, they would first have to summon the priest to have a look at the person and talk to them and see if, if, if this illness had been affected was uh, perhaps uh, something that could be cured spiritually. And then eventually then the person could then go see the, uh, the doctor. So I think it, it, it might not be specific and, and in the texts where they say, okay, well, this was divine punishment for sure for your illness. Your, your illness is caused by divine punishment. But because also the, the role of then the priest coming to then interview and make sure that everything was okay, it was almost like, well, the, there is some form of, of, um, of divine, at least uh, in, uh, divine um, 
they have to make sure that that wasn't necessarily uh, a divine punishment, right? So it's 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 acknowledging that there might have been uh, in the role of the interview, and so and I think that that's that's uh, at least in the colonial times that's something that we see that um, in the writings that they they summon the priest to interview first and check and make sure that the that the soul was not affected because of some kind of um, of divine illness and then uh, and then they could be healed in the case of Berseo, we also see in in some cases we see that the 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 character who is going to um, get saved at the end by the virgin mary in some cases they are afflicted by some kind of divine punishment in 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 some in some way and it's almost like the virgin mary in some way will say also that this this was um that she um she hadn't given it to them, but it, that she um, she was going to be able to save them because they would have to learn their lesson from this, and so uh, so there is um, there is um, some kind of uh, hinting that perhaps this was caused so that they could realize that they had sinned and then confess and then and then be saved. So there, there is, um, it isn't direct where they're saying it's, it's, uh, it is a divine punishment, but they're saying it was, it was the illness was given to them so that they could then realize that they were straying from the path and that they could then acknowledge that and then get back on the path. And so, uh, and I think that's something that we see also in the colonial texts and all the way up until the 18th century. There's lots of texts that they were written about saints and the lives of saints and how they also had some kind of, some in some cases where they had um, a crossroads where they ended up taking, the, finally had confessed their sin, they got on the right path and then they continued forward and did wonderful things. And I think that that's, uh, that's what we see here, that, uh, that this, uh, it's, it isn't necessarily, um, uh, uh, comes in the form of a divine punishment, but it is something, some kind of moment where they have, I guess, some form of enlightenment where they see that they have to make a change. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, um, you know, what messages would you like to say to young students and scholars interested in this type of collabor collaborative research activity? I would say do it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say do it because it is uh, a wonderful, incredible experience to be able to share with a group of uh, other scholars as well, um, the, an opportunity of, of looking at something in a very different way. Everyone who is collaborating on a project is going to bring something special to it. And it might be something that you uh, had never considered before but it is an opportunity to open to open your 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 academic opportunities to learning more from what other people have to to share and collaborative research is 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 very excellent for that uh we want in 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 the universities we we always talk about interdisciplinarity and how important interdisciplinarity is. And I think it is because it, it offers opportunity for learning more about other, about other fields, but it also op offers uh, an, an opportunity for you to, to really reflect on your own field and, and perhaps change things within the field because of influences of other people. And so I think that that, that part is really excellent. Um, for me, it's been wonderful because I have collaborated uh, on this project, but I've also collaborated with um, with some other with some other individuals. I recent my most recent collaboration is with uh, uh, Dr. Alma Montero at the Museo Nacional del Virreinato in Mexico, and we have been researching a convent in in in. Uh, in San Miguel de Allende and its origins and how it was founded, and so it it was it was an interesting experience. We she's a historian. Uh, I am from uh, I, I I my work is in 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 Hispanic studies, so I work a bit in literature and I work in in a bit in um, 
in history and she works in history and art and so we were able to combine all of that together to create an interesting project and it's the same with this particular project on the milagros de nuestra señora my research was always on the literature aspect of it literature and history but incorporating medical uh, a medical point of view to this has been very enriching for me so i think that it's um working and with technology the way things are today it makes it very possible to do collaborative research with people from anywhere in the world because as as we're we're doing this interview right now i am in canada and dr gondim is in brazil and uh and so it's it makes it very possible to do collaborations where maybe 50 60 years ago this would have been impossible to do and so I think that collaborative research these days is, is very possible and it's, it's going to be able to have people from different areas of the academies and different academies as well because uh, there's different um, uh, foundation or different uh, ways of, uh, of um, thoughts, uh, different ideals that come from different areas. And so you're getting a chance to share all of these, all these ideas and from different uh, disciplines and put together something that can be a very unique perspective on uh, or different unique reading on something such as what we have done on this project. Okay, good. So you're, <laughs> I think we are, um, Get at, getting at the end, so um, your final words for the audience. Oh, I would th like to uh, thank you very much for, for this opportunity and, uh, and I hope that uh, this, this interview and, uh, and the explanation and a little bit on, on the Milagros de Nuestra Señora will pique your interest and that you will continue to research some of these uh, topics uh, on your own. There are, um, I've included some links in, in my, my early presentation there so that you can uh, check out San Miguel de la Cogolla, you can check out Berceo. Uh, he has some works that are translated into uh, not, just, uh, in, in not just the original Spanish, but also in other languages as well, English translation. And, um, and I think that that would be uh, just a, uh, I think it's a, a good opportunity for, for, for people to, to just to see who he is and also the, um, the area where he, where he lived. And I think that that's uh, yeah. Some, a, a good way for, for people to, to become, to check out perhaps a, a, an area that they had not uh, checked out before. So, so thanks a lot, Professor Pamela Bastant for sharing your thoughts and spending your time uh, with this interview. We hope you enjoy and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.